Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Tim Fox here, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, our first section, which is about introduction to machine learning. So um, our objectives here are we're going to see the potential of machine learning, we're going to get the basic vocabulary, and we're going to get an overview of some major machine learning algorithms. Okay, so machine learning. Okay, so what do we mean by machine learning? So uh, one definition here by Arthur Samuel is it's the field of study that gives computers the ability to, to learn without being explicitly programmed. Okay, so let's use an example of self-driving cars. There are several different ways we could go about that. And traditionally, what we might have done is we might have tried to take and try to encode sort of all the rules of the road. You know, stop on red lights, do this, do that, that kind of thing. Now, for a lot of reasons, that approach would probably never work for a self-driving car. And if we took that approach, we probably never will have a self-driving car. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Now, the alternative approach, which is the more machine learning approach, is to record a human driver driving a car. And that would be record as in having cameras, sensors, you know, uh, that sort of thing on a human driver driving the cars. It would record the scenery, record the human reactions, and then what we would do is we'd take all that input and we would try to train a model that would be able to predict the next reaction. So a stop sign appears in the camera window and the human driver stops. So we get to a point where if the computer is able to predict exactly what the human driver is doing. Say, okay, well, this human driver should be braking now, and he or she is. Okay, so then we know the self-driving car is going to drive at least as well as that human would, and that is the approach that we're taking. Now, earlier days of artificial intelligence was based on top-down logic or symbolic logic, so the approach was very similar. Was actually very similar to how we would prove mathematical theorems. So we would take some uh, some basic rules, and we would then program those rules into a system, and then we would see if we could use those rules to, to derive other kinds of inferences. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and in, in and if your goal, for example, is to do a th like a theorem a theorem prover or whatever, that approach is very effective. And, um, in fact, um, there are some domains where that's still used a lot. But the problem is, is that um, there's just too many rules. And uh, that works well if we're working on a domain with very specific rules, like, say, like chess playing programs, right? So, in that case, the, the rules are very well known and understood, right? And so, um, and so a rule-based algorithm works well. But other approaches, like, say, recognizing what's an image, not so well. Now, the opposite approach we have here is bottom-up. So let's see if we can learn from the ground up, so a data-driven approach. Think about how babies learn to talk. So we don't hand them a dictionary and a grammar book and say, okay, here you go. We're going to teach you how to learn. Of course, you know, it'll be many, many years before any of the children learning how to talk could even comprehend a dictionary and a grammar book, right? But yet... Babies from a very young age are able to learn how to talk. How do they do it? Well, they do it through an abundance of data, right? Is that babies are hearing over and over and over again millions of training examples of correctly spoken language. And through that, they're able to make inferences. So the baby can't say, why is it this way? There, in fact, it, it, it will be many, many years before that why question could even be answered. It is just the baby is just going to make an inference based on lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. So the focus, again, is on data. And so we get more data, we get smarter systems. And for this approach, we often do need a lot of data. So think about it. You can't just speak to a baby for a day and all of a sudden expect the baby to know how to talk. It works because the baby's exposed to a lot and a lot of data and is able to build a model on that. 
So more data, smarter systems, right? And there's been a lot of success stories on this. Image recognition, language translation, self-driving cars, et cetera. So say example for spam detection, right? So actually spam detection is something that um, is built into many of the applications we use for email, like Gmail, for example. And you could try to code some spam filter like this. You know, if the email is from one of these IP addresses, then it's not spam. But if it contains terms like free loans, cheap degrees, et cetera, then spam. Now, it turns out that spam filters don't work like that in real life. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why. Now, the way spam filters do work is using a machine learning approach. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of spam emails and a bunch of not spam emails. And we're going to make those into our training data set. And so what we'll do is we'll create a, we'll then train the ML algorithm by learning. And so that training then will then learn how to perform this classification task of this now. Once that task is learned, we can apply that to new email. So a new email comes in and it says, turn your computer into a cash machine. And you said, hmm, spam. Right? And so that's because uh, we've been able to see similar kinds of emails with certain, you know, spammy terms, you know, other, other factors that might lead that to predict that as spam. Or let's consider translation. So, um, uh, so imagine you're trying to create a translation system between English and Japanese. So you can code in the English dictionary and grammar rules, Japanese dictionary and grammar rules with the translation rules. Now you're ready to translate. But the problem is, is that that doesn't really work very well. Lots and lots of exceptions, et cetera. You get translations like the minister of agriculture translated as the priest of farming, right? So you can, <laughs> you can see where that goes from. But that's uh, obviously a very, not a very good translation. Now, Google Translate actually takes a different approach. Um, so... Many of you have probably followed and used Google Translate from uh, maybe long back. And um, you can see, actually, its performance in making more idiomatic translations has improved over the years. Um, it's basically learned on bilingual texts from the Internet. So if you, like, have your company's, say, website in English, Spanish, and French, then now, uh, now uh, Google has three bilingual texts, you know, English and Spanish, English and French, Spanish and French, etc., and is able to learn models based on that bilingual text. So you can see here in this slide, those of you who know Spanish, you can see the old translation from this, uh, this uh, quote here by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, the old translation is mm, more kind of literal and a bit sort of stiff, sort of, uh, but... The, 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 the newer translation is a lot more idiomatic and a lot closer to the kind of the heart of what was being trying to be said there. So, and you can see how that goes. And you can also witness that Google Translate actually works best for translations in which there's a lot of data to be had. So like, for example, English and Spanish, English and French would certainly be in that category. Um, you know, between, say... Um, you know, maybe small languages, uh, like, say, Greek, say, or, uh, as this is an example, uh, going to another s a small language like Thai, for example. Um, I mean, again, there's lots of speakers of those languages. I don't mean to knock Greeks or Thai speakers. But the point is, is that there's less data with those, especially between each other, right? And so we might not expect as good of a translation there. So, um, okay. So uh, there is, so bottom-up, uh, AI stories, there's many of them in areas such as image recognition, fate, in this case we're showing facial recognition, language translation, self-driving cars, etc. So um, you probably have seen some of these examples here and on image recognition of cats and dogs. So here we have some training data, got pictures of cats, pictures of dogs. And we're going to use that. We say, okay, this is a cat, this is a cat, cat, this is dog, this is dog. We're going to train a model. And then when we get testing data, we can see, okay, so um, we're going to try to predict. We see this and we say, dog. Eh, nope, that wasn't a dog. So that one was wrong. But these two were right. And so we're able to evaluate how effective our model is. This actually comes from a Kaggle competition where there were 25,000 sample images to train. 
And um, you can see varying levels of difficulty, right? So this one here on the right, a little bit harder <laughs> to actually get right. So because it actually has both a cat and a dog. Um, now, the winning algorithm was able to get the correct one almost 99% of the time. So, all right, so let's talk about a little get a bit of a glimpse of AI history. Back in the 60s, computers were playing chess. Um, believe it or not, in the 80s and 90s, there was a, something called the AI desert, where you got a little bit oversold, doesn't live up to the promise, but that is all changed now with the advent of big data. Now, um, it, it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody that uh, right now we're kind of in sort of a golden era of, um, of uh, AI. And there's several things that have kind of brought that together. First of all, big data. So a lot of AI approaches have proven, especially in, in machine learning, have proven most effective when we have a lot of data. And we're in an era now of big data. Um, it's no, no, no coincidence that the boom in big data technologies like Hadoop has given birth to a renaissance of AI because the two are very closely related to each other. And you can see that the platforms in big data have kind of driven this uh, AI revival. Now, in addition to big data, though, AI in, it can be very computationally intensive. And one of the reasons why earlier eras of AI weren't as effective is we just didn't have the horses at that time in terms of compute. Now, cloud platforms have given us ability to get massive compute power. So, of course, nowadays, a few bucks will buy you plenty of horsepower on any of the cloud platforms, including AWS, as mentioned here in the slide. So, uh, and we can get this on demand. Let's say I have a workload where I need thousands of nodes. It'd be hard for me to set up thousands of nodes uh, in my basement if I, if I wanted to do it. But assuming I have a credit card, I can go ahead and do that on the cloud. Another thing is advancement in hardware, particularly in the area of GPUs. Now, CPUs in recent times have had multiple cores. I mean, even the most, you know, kind of cheaper level CPUs these days have at least two cores. And the, uh, this is, you know, I expanding. But typically when we talk about cores, you know, we're talking about maybe four cores, eight cores, 16 cores, perhaps. Now, a GPU is thousands of cores. And so, but those cores, of course, are different than CPU cores, more specialized to certain kinds of operations. Um, luckily, though, GPU cores, which are originally, of course, designed for graphics, are also good at the same kind of math, matrix, linear algebra type of operations that we're going to need to do in most types of AI. So, and it's able to do that with thousands of parallel operations, which is great for a lot of the AI stuff that we want to do. So, now, not to be outdone, modern CPUs have improved their linear algebra performance tremendously. Um, and so uh, you can see here that um, Intel has made more uh, recent server-level CPUs here, which are considerably faster in terms of training performance. Um, and in fact, in some cases, are competitive with a GPU. So, um, so both CPUs and GPUs are uh, designed now more and more to be able to accommodate very heavy-duty AI-based linear algebra workloads. Now, um, this is taking a little bit of a cue from Bitcoin miners, who most of whom long ago shifted from s GPUs to custom silicon for design for the task. In AI, we're seeing something similar, where uh, we have customized silicon, which is designed to be even faster than its GPU by being specifically designed for machine learning tasks. One example of that is Google's TPU. Um, TPU is um, designed by Google to be specifically for running AI workloads and especially for TensorFlow, which we're going to look at um, in a couple weeks. Um, so TPU is available in Google Cloud Platform. As a matter of fact, um, we're going to be looking at uh, using TPUs on some of our lab uh, applications. So we can go ahead and take a look at that. Here is a picture of Google's TPU data centers. Currently, you can only use TPUs on Google's um, in Google's data centers 
for if you're not a Google employee, then mostly that involves with either a Google Cloud Platform or with some of Google's publicly available services, including Code Laboratory, which is one thing we're going to look at in some of our labs. Okay, so let's talk about some machine learning use cases. How can ML help a business? So there's a lot of ways, but let's kind of start from the beginning here. Think about, let's say that you're a company and you're maybe in finance, so you have um, a credit card application. So, so you, for many years, your company has been reviewing credit card applications. And what happens is, is some customer fills out a form and that form then gets sent to an analyst or a group of analysts. And these analysts spend all day looking at people's applications. So then the analysts then have to get the, the information like the credit score, you, you know, all the kind of things on the credit score, uh, all that stuff. Then they're going to say, okay, approved or rejected. Now, let's say that you and a company have a very popular credit card, have a great deal of success. So good for you. That means that maybe your application volume has gone up considerably. Now, your current analysts can't handle the new volume. So what are you going to do? Well, you could hire a whole bunch of new analysts. But here's a problem. The new analysts are new, right? And so they, um, you're going to train them, but they may or may not kind of be the same in terms of their overall viewpoint as previous analysts were. So it might involve some sort of inconsistency and, or unfair approval processes. Now, fortunately, your company has a huge history of, uh, of uh, applications, and you've been able to, say, approved, rejected, et cetera, for all of those. For years and years and years of human analysts. Why don't we take that and use that as a training data set? So we take all of these real applications. Then we're going to say, okay, approved rejected, reproved, et cetera. And so we then are going to develop a model. The mo what the model's going to do is going to then flag algorithms based on prior data with one of three things, either approved, rejected, or in marginal cases, we'll have it do a flag thing, which will then forward that to our analysts who can then manually approve or reject it. Then those same those same marginal cases now can be added to the data set of training now with the new approved or rejected label. So what are some of the advantages and challenges here? First of all, the machine learning is going to be learning from data. In other words, from what actually happened in the data. So in that ways, it can be more accurate because a lot of times um, our human knowledge is, can be somewhat inconsistent. Um, and not always data-driven. People make decisions all the time that aren't driven from data at all, right? And so, uh, so that can be more accurate. It can also be automated. So once we do that, deploy this machine learning in, in production, the actual amount of time it takes to do that would be very little, milliseconds, right? And so it can be completely automated. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it can, and that means the customer can immediately get approved or, or not approved. Um, customizable and scalable so we can scale for large amounts of data. Now, challenges are is that your machine learning model is only going to be good as your data. And that data may not be in the right and ready to use form. You might have to spend a lot of human effort in order to get it to that form. Also, trying to measure your accuracy, that could be complicated, right? So we may need to have some better information on that. Um, also, there's a lot of different ways we can do machine learning, and they work differently. So choosing the best algorithm, that can be very important. Okay, so what are some ap other applications other than credit card uh, ap uh, approvals and that sort of thing? Well, um, so uh, we can look at credit card fraud. Um, uh, so uh, that's one very common use case that's being used for machine learning. Recommendations millions of products and users, genome data manipulation. So um, many human diseases are related to genetics. No surprise there. Problem is, is that in most cases, it's usually very complicated. Lots and lots and lots of interactions of many genes. And of course, we on our genotypes have millions of genes. So there's lots and lots of different combinatoric possibilities there. Um, however, we can use machine learning to try to help determine associations between 
genes and disease. And in fact, this is a, a very common area where machine learning is being, currently being used in, in, in terms of research science. Um, language translation, we've already talked about. Okay, so let's talk about the machine learning ecosystem. Now, sometimes people ask me, what's the difference between artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, ML, and deep learning? Now, different people have different definitions, and, um, but here's how I define them. I look at all three of these things as kind of subsets. So in other words, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So artificial intelligence, I consider that kind of a broader concept. And it means that machines are able to, to carry out smart tasks, intelligent tasks. That could involve a lot of different things. For example, chess playing programs. Many of them are definitely AI, but um, not all of them. In fact, traditional chess playing programs are not, do not use machine learning approaches. So they are AI, but not ML. Right, and so, and there's many, many similar kinds of things. ML is one approach to AI, um, and there's a couple of things that kind of identify machine learning as opposed to other approaches in AI. Um, so, it's a application it, AI. It learns is learning. For, it's data driven. So, data driven means is that we're going to be doing a bottom up, data driven approach. So, uh, top down AI is not ML. It may be useful, actually. It's, it top-down AI uh, is actually having a bit of a resurgence right now, but it's not ML, and it's not an approach that, were, that was considered ML. So that's one thing. The other thing is that ML is going to be learned using mathematical and statistical models. So um, we're going to be using, uh, especially on the statistical side, uh, we're going to be borrowing a lot from applied statistics in the area of machine learning. Now, deep learning is one particular kind of machine learning. There are many other kinds of machine learning. It's one particular kind of machine learning. It's going to involve neural networks, and the term deep is a specific kind of neural networks, namely neural networks that have many layers. Um, and it's going to be, there are certain problems that are very well suited toward deep learning and perform better on that approach than other approaches in machine learning. Now, Deep learning uses neural networks. So neural networks have been around for a really long time. In fact, uh, early conceptual models of neural networks go all the way back into the 50s, believe it or not. Um, now, neural networks um, had fallen out of favor uh, for a while because uh, they were considered kind of brute force. And um, there were other approaches um, that were um, getting better results. However, um, Deep learning, because now um, are no longer considered brute force, although they are computationally intensive, because we have the hardware today to make that effective. So um, examples like Google Translate, Facebook DeepFace, Google DeepMind, many, many other examples are using deep learning-based approaches. It's not the only approach that's being used, but it is a very popular one for good reason. So an example of a problem that would be particularly well-suited to deep learning as compared to other approaches would be face recognition. So one of the advantages of that is that by using multiple hidden layers, an algorithm is, this al is able to learn higher and higher abstractions of features. Now, these abstractions aren't something that a human being has programmed. Those abstractions are going to be learned by the process of training. And so you can see here that as we get into deeper and deeper layers, the basic picture elements are combined together in order to form increasingly abstract and complex representations. The kind of things that in your subconscious, your mind is doing yourself. Now, you don't think of this. You don't think of, okay, so, you know, this element here combines here to form this and da 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 You don't think about it that way. You think it's like, ah, I see that face and I know that's Bob, right? Or that's Mary. You know, get, it's like, you know that kind of instinctively and subconsciously. But it's because your brain has been able to make a mapping that's very high level of the lower level elements. And it's done that undoubtedly through the same way, through a cascading series of layers in your brain's neural representation of that data. So... That's the, one of the promises of deep neural networks. Now, comparing machine learning and deep learning. So 
when I say machine learning, of course, as I said, deep learning is a kind of machine learning. But we do sometimes separate them because a lot of times the tooling we use for deep learning is different. So um, one difference is, is that deep learning normally requires a lot of data. So um, that is, uh, of course, there are, there are some ways around that and there are some more advanced approaches. However, machi traditional machine learning can perform reasonably well on relatively small data. So um, now, not all of them, but there are certainly some approaches that uh, can be, do well with small amounts of data. Whereas with deep learning, we traditionally at least are thought of as using more data. Um, now, um, deep learning can scale well with a large amount of data. It normally needs a lot of compute power. And this is, uh, there are some approaches in machine learning that can perform well with relatively less compute power, which is one reason why um, deep learning approaches in the past weren't as popular. Um, uh, now, deep learning is going to make a good use of a GPU because of its uh, compute power. There are other operations in machine learning that aren't, the G for which GPU is not necessarily all that helpful. Um, now, one other difference is the way we are selecting and engineering features. So with more traditional machine learning, Features are normally selected manually and transformed manually by experts. This is why data scientists get paid the big bucks. Now, deep learning, in theory, can help learn some of those representations itself automatically, which is great. Um, however, that process could take longer, days, whereas you know execution time for traditional machine learning can often be much faster but part of that is because a lot of those inferences are done at input. And so, um, now, deep learning is notoriously hard and opaque in terms of understanding the final model. Once you get a deep learning model, it's, almost, it's very difficult to really try to make any sense of it because it's, it's not, it's, uh, it, it, it consists of millions and millions of different values of weights and biases. Um, and if somebody asks, well, why did the model say this versus this? Like, for example, why did the model give a person this credit score? Well, that might be hard to answer that question with a deep learning model. However, with some kinds of traditional machine learning models, for example, especially things like decision trees, that answer can be very easily generated. Say, well, the person has this credit score because blah, 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 blah. Right? And so um, now uh, comparing performance in and data, well, as we can see, with less data, more traditional approaches of machine learning can actually perform better. But, in fact, as we were in the era of the 80s and 90s, other approaches generally perform better overall, given the scale that we had at the time. Data size, model size, everything. But, as time has marched on, more compute, which allows us to be more math, more data, more everything, boom neural networks have been more effective. Now, looking at the ecosystem of software, there are different approaches. Now, you can see here, different languages, Java, Python, R, et cetera, are used. In this class, we're focused mostly on Python. So we're going to be looking at scikit-learn here for traditional machine learning. And they're going to be starting with that this week and next week. Uh, for deep learning, of course, you can see that there are a number of uh, of deep learning libraries used. Namely, TensorFlow is one of the things we'll be looking at in this class, but there's many others, right? Now, as I said before, typically traditional machine learning libraries like scikit-learn are not deep learning libraries, and they don't really try to do that, right? They're somewhat separate, you know? So, um, so uh, although there is some overlap, they're mostly separate here, you can see. Now, as you can see here, there are some libraries that are mainly designed for distributed uh, machine learning and deep learning. Um, and libraries like H2O and Spark are well known in the big data space. And so big data, of course, is all about distributed operation. And that's one example of how we're doing that um, here. Now, the cloud vendors are another thing to mention because uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're kind of our three big names in the area of uh, cloud. And um, they also realize the importance of artificial intelligence to the overall capability of their cloud platforms. 
And so they develop a lot of efforts to ensure that people will use their cloud platforms and so offer a lot of functionality that may not be available outside that cloud. So now in data science, the two main languages that tend to be used in modern era are R and Python languages, um, both of which have a very large number of libraries around the areas of analytics, um, statistics, mathematics, science, machine learning, all of those things. And they have a lot of popularity. Now, one, traditionally, a lot of the data science worth in both languages was not really designed to be parallelized. It was mainly designed to fit on a single machine. Um, now, there are a whole other set of frameworks which are designed to take that to a cluster, right? And so um, big data tools are going to allow us to be able to run those algorithms at massive scale across a cluster. Now, traditional ML is a lot of times over on a single node and is really usually the model that is there is usually designed around an analyst who's working on a workstation um, and they're going to load pretty much most or all the data in memory and they're going to be doing that operation there largely on a CPU. Now, um, on big data, that model is, we're going to we're realize that that model isn't scalable. So we're going to be changing the way we're going to operate. We're going to be going on single pass computes that are stateless and we're going to be using GPUs more often and we're going to be distributed across many multiple machines. Obviously, you can see the direction that we're moving in this era, right? So now there are some specific tools that are designed specifically for scalable machine learning. And a lot of these overlap with kind of the big data ecosystem. So things, there's frameworks like Spark, for example, uh, which is very popular in terms of doing big data processing. Um, that is, has a machine learning component called Spark ML Lib and is, is there. Now, the cloud vendors like Amazon Machine Learning, and the same thing is true of Azure and Google GCP, all of them have scalable kind of uh, cluster-based ML that you can run on their clouds. Um, H2O is another library, which is somewhat like Spark. In fact, it can integrate with Spark, but it has its own AI-oriented uh, functionality that um, is also part of the big data ecosystem. Now, uh, we're going to be looking, of course, at uh, TensorFlow here, uh, starting with week number three. And it is uh, also designed for scalable deep learning. Now, remember, we said most libraries do either mach traditional machine learning or deep learning. And um, TensorFlow uh, fits mostly in the latter category, deep learning. Uh, now, Spark ML that I talked about before is designed more for traditional machine learning. But... Uh, there is an add-on library uh, called uh, BigDL, which is by intro, that brings deep learning capabilities to Apache Spark. So, um, okay. So, we're going to now talk about machine learning algorithms. Now, there's a lot of different approaches to machine learning. And what we're going to talk about in this class really just scratches the surface of that. Um, so, there's basically, there's several different categories that we have of machine learning and there are also some more advanced ones that goes beyond this. But that is um, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and recommendations, which has some aspects of both supervised and unsupervised learning. So um, now within the category of supervised learning, we have several different ways and approaches of doing that. Uh, namely, we can do regressions and classifications both of which are a type of supervised prediction. Regression means is that you're going to try to predict some real number output. So, for example, like a house price or a stock price or other things like that. Right? So those are all examples of regression problems. Um, and there's a lot of different ways we can do that. We're going to look um, this week at one such way, linear regression. But there are many others. Classification is a very similar problem. But instead of trying to predict some kind of real number output like a stock price, instead we're going to try to predict um, a category. Is this cancer or not? Or what kind of cancer is it, to say? Or is this a spam email or not a spam email? And there's a whole bunch of algorithms that can do that as well. Logistic regression being one that we'll briefly look at this week. A number of others we'll be looking at next week. Now, decision trees are a, are a type of uh, algorithm which 
oh, we'll also be looking at, I think, mostly next week. Um, it is um, – this is uh, uh, going to be – can be used for both classification and regression. Uh, and so there's a number of different types of, of approaches to that. Um, random forest, for example, is being one approach. So, okay. Now, that all comes into the category of supervised machine learning. And we'll talk a minute about exactly what that means. Um, unsupervised machine learning has a whole bunch of different problems. Uh, so uh, clustering is an example. It's kind of the classic example of unsupervised machine learning. So doing things like grouping Uber trips or trying to cluster DNA data, right? So this is an example of unsupervised machine learning because we're not saying, for example, what groups of gen genes we're trying to group together. No, we're going to infer that based on the data that we have, right? So um, also another type of unsupervised machine learning is dimensionality reduction, whereas we're going to try to learn a lower, a, a lower dimensional way to represent the data. And we'll talk about that. Other things like topic discovery, text mining, these things are un of examples of unsupervised machine learning. And in recommendations we'll talk about as well, those are, um, can be treated as either supervised or unsupervised, um, and sometimes involving a bit of both. Okay, so let's talk about how we do machine learning. Well, first of all, we have to get data. Now, typically, the more data we have, the better. And so that could come from things like log files, like click streams, external sources, say like credit scores of customers. Well, then we have to prepare the data. Now, this is kind of an undersung part of machine learning because it's crucial to your success to how clean and ready to go your data is. It also involves a lot of grunt work, right? And there's no way around that. But data quality can be extremely important, even as maybe more so than data quantity, which is kind of what we just were talking about. Um, then we're going to train the model, feed that data to the model so we can learn. We'll evaluate our model's metrics, like accuracy, for example. Then normally we need to improve our model. So we can try maybe adding more data, choosing different algorithm, et cetera. Now, there are different kinds of machine learning. The most traditional one is called supervised machine learning. And that's largely what we're going to be looking at in this course, just because that's a good place to start. Um, it, it involves the idea of labels. And labels simply just mean that we're going to be giving training data that's going to have the answers provided. So it's like, here are some examples that we want to learn from, and here are the answers. The, then it will be able to predict on new data. Um, unsupervised machine learning doesn't have these labels. It's used for different kinds of problems. So it's gonna, there are some kinds of problems where we're just looking for natural patterns in the data. Um, now, semi-supervised learning involves a little bit of both. It's a more advanced technique. But what it involves is, say, a, lar a training set that has a large number of unlabeled data, meaning it's just this is just data we were able to collect, but we don't know what the answer should be. And then a small subset of that, which are labeled. So here's the ones that we have. Problem is, is that in a lot of big data scenarios, it might not be practical to have a human being be able to generate uh, answers, labels for all of them, right? So uh, we might be able to get, say, you could have like millions of images, but you might only be able to practically get a human being to look at maybe a few thousand of them, right? So you could do semi-supervised learning to combine together the, the rest of them. So another advanced approach is called reinforcement learning. You probably have heard of this. It is actually based a lot on gameplay. And in fact, one company named DeepMind has been very um, uh, use uh, reinforcement learning a lot to learn how to play old video games. I know that sounds crazy that you get paid to actually learn how to play old video games. But the idea behind that is, is that it, you can use that to help build that kind of gameplay-oriented approach for a lot of very practical real-world problems. Okay, so we talked about supervised learning. Again, we're going to learn from our training data. So then we're going to be able to predict on unseen data. And there's two basic kinds of supervised machine learning. There's classification where we're going to try to categorize things into groups like spam classification, fraud not, or not fraud, etc. And regression, which is going to involve with dealing with predicting of real numbers or calculating probabilities. Um, so things like house prices, stock market, et cetera. So those are all 
supervised machine learning, right? Because in all those cases, if we're trying to predict the stock market, we're, we're doing on historical data, which means we know what the stock market was at those historical times, right? Uh, so all of those things are supervised machine learning because we're giving it data and we're giving it answers to learn from. Now, unsupervised machine learning doesn't involve training at all. So it's trying to find patterns in the data. Now, if the keyword before with that is on prediction, in unsupervised machine learning, it's all about inference. So things like clustering, for example. What are some of the natural patterns in this data? Um, association. People who bought this also bought this, right? So again, those are inferences that are learned from the data. We didn't have a human saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at people that bought this and this, right? It's like, no, there's going to be those associations that are going to be inferred by a model that is looking at the data. Dimensional eye reduction also is going to be learned by how we can take thousands of variables into a, a manageable size. We're not going to tell it what, how to go from this number of, to this number of dimensions. It's going to learn a representation of features that does that. Now, semi-supervised learning involves, again, some labeled data, some unlabeled data. It turns out that unlabeled data, together with labeled data, can be more effective than the labeled data alone. It works by combining clustering with supervised methods. So in this case, we have here a cluster. So we have cluster and we have some labeled data where this one's a cat, this one's a cat. We also have a bunch of other points that are right around the cats. Now, it's reasonable to assume that although we don't know what this label is, there's a good chance it's also a cat. And by having this information, this helps us understand what are kind of the boundaries of this nature of cat, right? Okay. Now, let's talk about some more supervised examples. So, one example is predicting the stock market, right? So, you're probably thinking, wow, if I can do this, I don't have to come to work anymore. I can just go and use my AI model to predict the stock market. I don't actually recommend that right now, by the way. So before you um, kind of... Uh, uh, cash out your 401k and try this. I, you know, again, you might want to might want to perfect your skills a bit. Just saying. But again, in theory, you could train your model on your um, on your on some historical data, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to test that. And I highly recommend that if you're going to try this in the stock market. So we're going to train it here. And um, we're going to be able to see. So let's say, for example, we trained up to right there, right? So now we're going to see how well our model did. So notice the market was kind of on an upswing, right? So if our model was a lot like typical uh, CNBC things, it's going to be saying, oh, well, see, it's been going up. So it's obviously going up, up, up and away, buying opportunity, right? But we can test that. right? So it turns out in real life it didn't. In fact, it kind of took a dip and then it took another dip, right? So... We're going to see if our model was able to predict these dips. And if it did, then we might have more confidence that once we get to the future, then we're able to make good predictions on what to buy and when to sell. So, so whenever we do supervised machine learning, we need to divide our data set. And we need to have training data. And we should have test data too. The test data is going to help us to evaluate that. Now, we're going to learn later about a mechanism for training called cross-validation which basically means we're going to test as we train. So um, we're going to have some data that we're going to use for cross-validation as well as some data for tests. And we can kind of tweak that to understand how we're going to uh, 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 get the most effective results. Now, classification, as we said before, is all about dividing your data into buckets. So is email spam or not a ham? Is, this, is the cell cancerous or healthy? These are all classification problems, right? And so you can see we're getting mixed data and we're trying to classify it here and here. Is your email spam or not? Is your website authentic or fraudulent? Is this cell cancerous? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many, 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 many opportunities here for a classification problem. Okay, so all that was supervised machine learning. Now we're going to talk a little bit about unsupervised machine learning. So it's all about drawing inference from your data without having 
labels. Now, labels, remember, whenever we hear the word labels, you think supervised learning or at least semi-supervised. So for unsupervised machine learning, there are no labels. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something, for example, in fact, the classic approach is called clustering. So things like, for example, k-means. We want to group our data points into a cluster. Another example would be hidden Markov models in which what we're going to be doing is we're going to be inferring state transitions. We're going to be assuming that there's a state that we're going to, and we're going to be inferring what that state is in our system. So examples, finding patterns, expressing genes, recovering the states from a series of trans transitions. Another example that's typically unsupervised is anomaly detect detection. Now, whenever we do anomaly detection, we're basically looking for things that are different, right? So now you might have typical traffic here, and then you might get this one here. So if you look at this chart here, you could say, you know, that one is different. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's fraud. It may not be fraud or whatever we're looking for, right? It might just be unusual. Some, sometimes things are just unusual, right? But it's a good bet that a lot of fraudulent activity would in fact be unusual, even if not all unusual stuff would be fraud. And so it would be a good way to do that. Now, this is typically done using unsupervised machine learning because we don't want to bake into our model exactly in what way our things should be different. We should just say, okay, it's well, it's different, right? And so that's a more of an unsupervised problem because fraudsters have all kinds of ingenious, tricky ways to be fraud. And the only thing they all have in common is they're all different from typical activity. So we don't want to be too specific in our model of exactly how things can be fraudulent. We want to allow the model to infer that. Another example here, we see Google News. You probably notice this. You go there and there's a story about Starbucks sales or Google Home, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, well, boom, we have this and there is like 100 other stories based on that. Now, I can tell you, Google didn't train that by coming up and saying, okay, here's a bunch of stories and these are all about Starbucks, so the label on this is Starbucks. No, I mean, that wouldn't work anyway because as new, new stories come in, well, they could be about different topics. So instead, it's going to learn cluster-based relationships on that. And that's unsupervised machine learning. Okay, so clustering, again, is something we as humans do just instinctively, right? We see a bunch of data. We try to organize it, categorize it. This is this, and that must be that, and these are a group here, right? And we do that because we want to understand our data, and we want to find more like this, right? So many applications of clustering. Genomics, x-ray, you know, soccer moms, NASCAR dads, all this kind of, you know, customer, consumer grouping, um, politics, you know, you get it, right? So all kinds of different areas. You can look at it on the screen here of clustering applications. Okay. Now, other approaches here like reinforcement learning. Um, let's say, for example, you're learning to play a new video game and you don't know how to play. So how are you going to learn? Well, you could read the instructions, right? Ha ha ha. Not many people read instructions for video games, right? So instead, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going and trying some things. And, and uh, so you go in and you open a door and you get some more money or ammo and you, or you jump off a cliff and you get hurt and you lose health, right? So you try that. It's like, oops, jumping off a cliff, not a good idea, right? So the idea then is, is that you're getting this because you're getting reinforcement, right? So um, and then you're learning that. Now, we could do an algorithm to do this too, right? So... Through practice, we're able to do that. But we need to give some reinforcement, right? So when the robot is playing the game, it asks, you know, we give some very lightweight reinforcement. So in other words, um, the robot found some food and ate it and got a bonus. So there was reinforcement. That was good. Okay, that was a good thing, getting food. Ouch. And this is where you can see why game playing is the one way that we, we often train this kind of robot. But... We can use the game paradigm in a lot of actually real-world business problems. So um, an example of reinforcement learning in action is with the game of Go, which um, prior to this was thought to be a game in which computer AIs would have a difficult time beating humans uh, because there's a lot of complexities in this game beyond, the, beyond chess, actually. And that was true for some years, but... 
through reinforcement learning, AI has been able to learn to be very effective Go game players. So, um, and you can look at other examples here of, uh, of uh, open AI bots playing, playing data. So, so Google's DeepMind, uh, Google DeepMind um, has been a leader in the area of, of reinforcement learning. And contrary to what you might think, they don't always work on video games. In fact, they are able to uh, use their approach of reinforcement learning in order to do detection of a number of eye conditions with very high accuracy. Um, so many, many uh, reinforcement learning uh, success stories in this area. Other companies that, for example, OpenAI, one of Elon Musk's companies, uh, is working on this uh, working on this area as well. So, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the overall state of things. So uh, these are some of the topics we're going to be covering. We're going to talk about supervised and unsupervised machine learning um, and et cetera. Now, um, this will be in your, your notes here, but um, you can see here that there's many different um, – types of approaches to machine learning. Um, in fact, you know, we talk about deep learning. Uh, deep learning is here. And there is a, a lot of times, you know, these things have uh, numbers of three and four letter acronyms, as you can see. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit of an alphabet soup. Uh, so um, if you're a novice to machine learning, there's nothing wrong with that. You can use this as a little bit of an example. Aha, somebody talked about GBM, say, gradient boosted machines. And you find out, okay, so that's a type of ensemble machine learning which is itself a type of machine learning, right? So, and you get the idea. So I'm not going to go over all this now, but you can use this as a reference as we go through the course. Um, Elon Musk, who of course, who founded an AI company, um, is itself talking about uh, uh, the, the issues around AI. It, it, you know, whether or not you want to be an alarmist on this, it is also undeniable that AI is going to affect our lives in very, very significant ways. So um, uh, there are, uh, you know, there are a difference of his opinion on this, right? So Zuckerberg then is, uh, you know, kind of poo-poo's this doomsday scenario. Musk says he doesn't understand the AI. So you can go on that and, 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 and talk about that. So um, that brings me to the end of this talk. Now, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a follow-up here. And I'm going to be introducing our lab. Now, our lab for this section is going to be very, very short. Um, basically, it's just going to be kind of a hello world on a notebook. And so um, that's just going to be a way for you to kind of kick your tires a little bit and get going on that. So in our lab bundle, if you have it, that's going to be just the very first lab in week one. So um, so go ahead and, uh, and take a look at that. I'm going to record a... Um, a follow-on video to this, uh, which is uh, shortly, you'll be able to view shortly, that um, has that information. Um, so, uh, hope that you've enjoyed this talk, um, and uh, best of luck. So, I'll see you in the next section. Thanks.